after Queen Maud of Norway, a granddaughter of England's Queen Victoria, who liked to drink blood out of skulls, by the way. Hmm. Historical facts are well documented about this expedition. German ex uh, exploration of Antarctica reaches back to the 1800s. Most noted was the expedition in 1938, led by Captain Alfred Richter to Queen Maudland, situated east of the Weddell Sea, named for the English seal hunter James Weddell. Prior to the start of the expedition, the German Society of Polar Research invited the famous explorer Richard E. Byrd, and yes, that is the same Richard E. Byrd who supposedly went to what we call the center of the earth, which is associated with debunking theories. And what I mean by that is that the center of the earth has a core, but there are parts of the earth where we have underground cities and bases, which are real, and some of them have even been videotaped. So they invited Richard E. Byrd to Hamburg, where he showed uh, expedition members of this expedition that was going to be taking place, documentary of his Antarctic exploration, and told them what conditions to expect. Ironically, about 10 years later, the Navy's Admiral Byrd led his own military expedition to Antarctica. It was supposed to be a scientific expedition, but they took aircraft carriers and thousands of soldiers armed to the T for some reason. Well, why not? You never know when you're going to run into a dangerous group of... Uh Sea lions. Right. You know, Those ice fishers get really sure. upset having yeah. to set, set there all day. That's right. You never know what's going to happen. So, Capitan Rishner, or Rishar, renamed the area Nushvabenland in honor of his flagship Schwabenland, a floating laboratory that belonged to the Lufthansa Airline Company. It carried two amphibious aircraft, about 10 tons each. It's well documented part of a uh, scientific experiment, if you will. Now, Rischer's expedition were under direct order of the Reich Marshal Hermann Goering, Rudolf Hess, and other influential members of the secretive Fool Society. We've heard about the Fool Society before. We've done segments on the Fool Society. Also involved with the Vril Society and the Theoph or Theosophical Society. Was that the Full Society? The Thule Society, T-H-U-L-E. They actually were a big funder of the German Nazi Party rising to power, officially on a mission to study the feasibility of whaling in those waters. Richer proceeded to drop small swastika flags along separate flight paths to the southern pole, eventually staking out more than 600,000 square kilometers for the Reich. Richer was fascinated by reports from... That other guy named Waddle, or Waddell, mm -hmm. one of his reports in 1823, Waddell wrote, I quote, The ice in this region had completely disappeared. The temperature is mild. Birds were observed flying around the ship, and groups of whales frolicked in the wake of the craft. And, uh, end quote. It has been suggested that the Rachel expedition found just such a place one that contained huge ice caverns filled with warm water and living plants. Have you ever heard about this before, Nick? No, no this is new. This is new stuff. Yes. Have you ever heard of these, uh, the hollow earth theory? We talked about hollow moon last night. Have you right. heard about the hollow earth? No. You've never heard of the hollow earth theory? I have not. Have not. Interesting. I, I guess a lot of people believe that the center of the earth is hollow and there's a, there's a sun in the middle, right. which is kind of symbolic because the core is the hottest, right. but it's a lot of dense metals. But as I mentioned before, the hollow earth in, in, in another in another way is really just caverns right. you know, within the crust of the earth. Sure. Mm -hmm. So reportedly, these Germans discovered areas containing caves, one of which was reported to have led to a large underground lake warmed from geothermal heat. Persons in both Norway and Britain were aware of these ice-free areas but chose to suppress the information. They left them off of maps to prevent other nations from laying claim. Antarctica, theoretically, is the perfect secluded hideaway as it is approximately 5,600 miles from Africa, 4,760 miles from Australia, and 1,870 miles from the southernmost tip of South America. Richer and Schwabenland returned to Hamburg in April of 1939, but with war fears rising that year and Hitler's attack on Poland in September, the German expedition was quickly forgotten, all but by the higher Nazi command. By the mid-1940s, submarine bases had been built in Neuschwabenland that became the sites of a great buildup of supplies and materials in addition to servicing U-boats operating in the South Atlantic. 
This site served as the southernmost point in a Nazi triangle of influence, including South Africa and Argentina, which is where some people reported seeing Adolf Hitler and Joseph Mengele, the Angel of Death, after the war was over. This major base became known as New Berlin, or Base 211. This new base in Antarctica, and this is all documented and this is all well true. The further extents of this story is what we're trying to uncover. German Navy Grand Admiral Karl Bolnitz stated in 1943, quote, The German submarine fleet is proud of having built for the Führer in another part of the world a sh uh, Shangri-La on land, an impregnable fortress. The Norwegian Nazi Vidkom Kweisling at the trial of Nuremberg in 1945 stated, and I quote, I believe I fought for a just cause and I refused to run away from my responsibilities when the Nazis, shortly after their final collapse, offered to convey me aboard a submarine to safe refuge. There was also reports that when Allies closed in on the capital, for Hitler supposedly shot himself, that there was a mass UFO sighting over Germany and many high-ranking officials in the Reich were taken aboard these UFOs and disappeared. People say that those are aliens and they were connected with the Vril Society and communicating with otherworldly spirits and creatures. I don't think that that was that. I think it was probably German flying saucers, which they perfected. And we're going to get a little bit of that information coming up. The question of how the Nazis could have kept such a large base secret was explained in part by W.A. Harbinson, who stated, and I quote, regarding the possibility of the Germans building self-sufficient underground research factories in the Antarctic, it has only to be pointed out that the underground research centers of Nazi Germany were gigantic feats of construction containing wind tunnels, machine shops, assembly plants, launching pads, supply dumps, and accommodation for all who worked there, including adjoining camps for slaves, and yet very people very few people ever even knew they existed until i did the research nick i didn't even know that these existed yeah these large underground facilities in germany mm -hmm. not something they teach you in school not something that you're taught in school absolutely not mm -hmm. but they did exist and describing them would get you labeled a conspiracy theorist but mm -hmm. nevertheless they are there mm -hmm. by march of 1945 the total number of nazi submarines had reached about 463 this was recorded by british historian basil liddell hart of those 463, about 159 U-boats surrendered to the Allies' Nick. 203 were scuttled by their crews, and this left about 100 Nazi subs that were unaccounted for at the war's end. Wow. Now, in relation to Antarctica, check this out. An unmarked German U-boat surrendered to the Argentine Navy on June 10, 1945. Exactly one month later, a U-530 surrendered at Mar del Plata in Argentina. Just over a month later, on August 17th of 1945, the U-977 also surrendered at Mar del Plata. That same month, another sub, the U-465, was scuttled off the coast of Patagonia. These were large subs designed for transporting quantities of supplies and material. Even the U-530's chief torpedo officer, Wilhelm von Hott, revealed that his sub had landed at Antarctica, offloaded several crates that they believe contain documents as well as Nazi relics. What do you think about the testimony, even at Nuremberg, about yeah. the submarine bases and going to Antarctica? Yeah, very, very interesting. Uh, also, the fact that there were so many that were unaccounted for. So now you've named like four that had surrendered or had been caught, but what about the other 95, 96? What about the other 95 or 96? Yeah. Where are they at? There could be these uh, these submarines floating around right now in certain parts of the world, and they, they're not even, they don't even know the, the war is over. They're not really sure what's going on. <laughs> they're just waiting for the next battle. Still waiting for the next battle. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Then there was two expeditions which did take place, or supposedly one of them took place, the other one was a definite. In 1947, the expedition by Admiral uh, Richard E. Byrd, and also a British Special Force uh, unit, I guess, was sent to Antarctica in the, late, uh, in the late days of 1945 as well, and that was well documented. Now, Robert Byrd wrote in 2005, so just not too long ago, he said, Operation Tabarin, named for a Paris nightclub, was activated as a measure of monitoring German activities on the Antarctic continent. 
The known British bases, which the British apparently had bases there as well, were mainly in the Antarctic Peninsula in places such as Port Lockroy and Hope Bay and on the islands surrounding the peninsula. So now we have British bases as well, Nick. Right, right. And you said that uh, there was very little... Uh uh, remnants found of the uh, evidence found for the Nazi bases, but there was that one ice sculpture of the swastika they found. Right. right. Yes, that was found. Yeah. I've even, it was interesting because I, there's a lot of books written about this, and I had, uh, it's funny how the universe works because I had picked up this story, mm -hmm. and then I was reading uh, a series called Area 51, mm -hmm. and in the story they talked about how these guys went to Antarctica, there was an expedition like this, uh, and they went down into these large underground caverns and found fleets of German UFOs, which the Germans had perfected. They weren't alien technology, right. it was human technology. Right, right. And Hitler was obsessed with producing this alternative energy. Yeah. alternative free energy something we're going to talk about it's funny because a lot of people think that the Vril society were connected with these interdimensional spirits the women of the Vril society never cut their hair mm -hmm. they let it just grow out and they thought that that was like an antenna to connect them mm -hmm. to these spirits or whatnot mm -hmm. and many people believe that especially that siding over Berlin that these UFOs were aliens and helping the Nazis who were extremely uh, deep into occultism, the hidden what wasn't necessarily on the surface, and people think that the, the aliens helped them. It's also funny that Nikola Tesla, who developed free energy or free electricity, believe that maybe aliens helped him as well. According to an unnamed survivor, a member of the British Special Forces, there's a whole extensive story about this man. He went to the Falkland Islands for a special Arctic training. in the fall of 1945, and I believe for the most part that all of this is definitely documented. It was led by veterans of the Norwegian resistance and accompanied by an unmanned scientist, the special unit of British soldiers traveled to Antarctica. Now, it was told to Robert Byrd by this man that the original scientists and commandos had found an ancient tunnel, as they called it, and under orders the force went through the tunnel, but only two returned before the Antarctic winter set in. During the winter months, the two survivors made absurd claims over the radio about what they called polar men. Polar men. Polar men, Nick. Mm -hmm. Is this like frozen Germans? Or? It's like frozen German popsicles, yes. <laughs> they talked about polar men, ancient tunnels, and Nazis. And some of this, I don't know if this is recorded, but it's, well, probably documented in a transcript. Radio contact was finally lost in July of 1945, and, uh, and for their mission, it, they went into the unknown. The last broadcast brought them further anxiety as the final broadcast they picked up, I guess. They heard the voice that the polar men had found them, and then screams, and then contact was lost. Wow, this sounds like an excellent movie. It sounds like an excellent movie. Yeah. Why have we, we tried to make this, and then we had to make it into a comedy. Right. So <laughs> I threw the script out, is what had happened there. Yeah. It's really kind of amazing, though, when you think about it. It is an amazing, it is an amazing story. Yeah. And whether or not this is true, based on some form of fact, some form of mythos, it's an interesting story. And someone wrote this somewhere, whether it was based off of facts or right. they had an amazing imagination. Yeah, and I, and I find it very interesting that this is the first time I'm ever hearing it. Right. I, this is, and you know what? That is actually something that makes me think. Just not just because you maybe haven't heard it, but there's yeah. probably a lot of people who haven't heard it. Even in my research, this does not come right. up very much. Right. And when it does, it's all about well, these are just aliens from another dimension or another planet. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to take it a step further, and when I look into this, I, I find that issue is that not many people know about it, which might mean that it's actually closer to the truth than we think. Right. Because a lot of times these stories like Area 51 and Roswell, they're pushed so much into the public spectrum, into the public forum, that everyone knows about it, everyone's got their own opinion about it. And yes, that may be done to discredit it more so because everybody's got their opinion about it. Right. But then it also might be done to cover up another fact, and stories like this might be covered up so well that nobody knows about them. Right. And if you know about it and no one else knows about it, even if it is considered a conspiracy theory in the alternative realm, 
and you know about it, you get labeled even crazier than the conspiracy theorists. Sure. Well, this is all research that was documented, obviously, by someone. And, and if the uh, government or whoever it may be doesn't want to show up in textbooks and, and let, it, let it be known by anyone, well, then that's going to happen. And there is a part of this which is well documented. Harry Truman even tried to stop this expedition, and his military advisors advised him, you do not do this. Mm -hmm. We will go through with this military expedition. Mm -hmm. AKA scientific research, but we're going to send down aircraft carriers and bombs and missiles and mines, and we're going to just send a whole military sure. down to Antarctica because we need scientific photographs. Yeah, which they obviously needed also for the Icemen. Mm -hmm. For the Icemen, the Polar the Polar Men. Oh, polar Men. Yes. The Polar Men. I like that. So this survivor, Nick, he went on to describe uh, uh, tunnels. Uh, he said the Nazis had constructed a huge base into the caverns and had even built docks for U-boats, and one was identified, or and one was identified supposedly one of these U-boats. They never gave a number. Still, the deeper they traveled, the more stranger visions they greeted. They were greeted with. They were down in one of these tunnels. The survivor reported that the hangars for strange planes and excavations galore had been documented. Robert Byrd reported. Now a lot of people say, well, screw the cold down there; they would have died. Well, right. this is heated from geothermal heat from sure. inside the earth yeah. <laughs> this account of an anonymous source by robert would be easy to dismiss except that the details closely match a separate account given by the u-boat 530's captain bernhardt as published in his book 1988 or his 1988 book adolf hitler and the secrets of the holy lance co-authored by colonel howard uh Boichner, a respected new orleans physician and former medical officer with the u.s army's 45th Intra uh, infantry division rather during world war ii According to the story, on May 1, 1945, a Colonel Maximilian Hartmann delivered the ashes of Adolf Hitler and his still-living wife, Eva Braun, to the commander of the U-977 U-boat to be sent to the Nazi base in Antarctica. Now, just because we haven't... People say, well, we, we would have found it on satellites by now if it existed. Well, just because we haven't found it officially doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Of course. Yeah, who's to say we haven't found it? Exactly. What it means is that they haven't told us about it. Who's to say? I mean, do, 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 does the everyday average person have access to military satellites and thermal imaging? Exactly. No. So just because we have no evidence in the public spectrum, even in the private federal spectrum and the black budget programs that monitor or possibly monitor this kind of stuff, just because it's there, they might not even understand fully what it is. Right. Because you haven't even heard about this. Not at all. Some people probably haven't heard about this. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily that this base, if even if it was true, that it was established for any type of control or any type of power. It could have just been established for something a little bit more, something hidden, something occult. Mm. This strange tale also included an account concerning the recovery of the fabled Helig Lance, or Holy Lance, also known as the Spear of Destiny. Do you know what the Spear of Destiny is? No, I do not. That is the, uh, the spear that the Roman soldier, uh, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Gaius Cassius, or Longinus, by legend, he shoved it into the side of Jesus while he was on the cross to oh. shorten his agony. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's this, supposedly it's in the, uh, the, the Hofburg Museum in Vienna, but uh, in this story it says that that one is essentially a fake. Mm -hmm. But it is true that Hitler was desperately looking for this spear because you could use it for good or evil in a way, and it, 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 uh, it had an incredible power to it. Hmm. Interesting. Now back to Boichner, he said he saw the logbook, or he was, excuse me, shown the logbook from a 1979 expedition to Antarctica, which is another one in the 70s, which used helicopters to reach the deserted Nazi base. The logbook stated as followed, our lights penetrated the steel tunnels, which extends for approximately about 10 meters. When we arrive at the end of the tunnel, we find ourselves in a huge cavernous area. We penetrate into the cavern, the distance of about 300 meters. It is at the point, it is at this point, that we came to a smaller cavern, which turned towards the right and ended up in a room approximately 80 meters in width and 10 meters in height. It is here that the Reich treasures are hidden. At this point stands a small obelisk, about a meter in height, which marks the spot. There is an inscription which reads as follows, quote, There are truly more things in heaven, and parenthesis, in earth than man has dreamt beyond this point is agartha signed by nazi occultist karl haushofer in 1943 do you know what agartha is no 
Agarth is like the city of wisdom. I think it is symbolic and it is mythological in the terms of Agarth is also associated with the people that lived inside of the earth, the white brotherhood, if you will. White like the Aaron race, in a sense. Right. Talked about by the Theosophical Society and all of that we're going to get to in just a moment. Mm -hmm. It also talks about four items, at least four of the items that were recovered from Antarctica were the Holy Lance, a bronze plaque prized by Hitler, a 1934 watercolor painting by Hitler entitled, quote, Germania and the Appointment of the Gods at the Beginning of the World, end quote, and the infamous Blood Flag, a sacred Nazi relic from the 1923 Beer Hall Pooch. And while all of this could be chalked up to some sort of fantasy, it fails to explain the well-documented 1946 to 1947 military expedition to Antarctica, codenamed Operation High Jump, led by Admiral Richard Byrd. The task force was under the command of Admiral Richard H. Cruzen and continues to be the largest Antarctic expedition ever organized. It remains a mystery that convinced the Navy to fund this massive task force to Antarctica or why it was rushed into operation so soon after the war ended. Mm -hmm. Harry Truman tried to stop the expedition but was compelled to rely on the advice of his military advisors mm -hmm. to hold back. Named the United States Navy Antarctic De uh, Developments Program, this U.S. Navy operation reached its destination in January of 1947 and lasted only until February. This force consisted of, listen to this, they sent this expedition to Antarctica to supposedly study science, some type of science expedition, take photographs and map out the terrain. Okay. This force consisted of 4,700 men, 13 ships, including an aircraft carrier with six twin-engine transport planes and helicopters. Byrd made it plain that the operation's objectives were not diplomatic, scientific, or economic. According to the military, the expedition was hastily mounted to take advantage of the first Antarctic summer after the war. Near the end of January of 1947, a two-pronged renaissance sweep of Antarctica, an ice-free area, was discovered by one of the force's flying boats. Bird described it as a land of blue and green lakes and brown hills and an otherwise limitless expanse of ice. The news, which this is a true story, the news deemed this Shangri-La, which is another form of Agatha or Asgard. The deaths of several members of this task force were never fully explained. They didn't even say that, well, it was just the cold. They said that they died in plane crashes and they blew up. I don't know what blew up. I mean, blow up. They, they, that was the explanation. They said, what happened to these guys? And they said they blew up. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what... Yeah, that could be a number of things. It could be a number of things, Nick. Yeah, yeah. Another fact that undermined the argument that the expedition was merely for exploration was that while members took more than 70,000 photographs of the Antarctic coastline, none were made with the reference markers necessary to match the photographs together for comprehensive view. They later went back and sent a very small task force of just a couple of people to go photograph the same area. Right. So Bird, Richard Bird, upon his return from Antarctica, warned of the possibility, listen to this, the possibility of an attack from the polar regions by aircraft of incredible speed. It was reported on March 5th of 1947 in the edition of El Mosur, uh, Mercurio in Santiago, Chile. The reporter Lee Van Ada, who had accompanied Byrd, wrote, quote, Admiral Richard E. Byrd announced today that it is necessary for the United States to put into effort defensive measures against enemy airmen who come from the polar regions. Mm -hmm. The admiral said, I have no intention of scaring anyone or anyone, but the bitter reality is that in case of a new war, the United States would be in a position of being attacked by aircraft that could fly with fantastic speed from one pole to the other. His manuscript was made public in 1970, Richard Byrd, that purported to be a secret diary. So Byrd reported sighting a small mountain range with what appeared to be a valley lined with green trees, a river or stream flowing through it. This diary also reported spotting a large animal that resembled a woolly mammoth. He said in the diary, and I quote, Ahead we spotted what seemed to be a city. This is impossible. Aircraft, his aircraft seemed to light and oddly buoyant. The controls refused to respond. Off our port and starboard.